Welcome everyone. Uh, it's 6.00, so we will start sharp. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar, How to Pitch a Social Business Idea. My name is Paula Begudian, and I'm one of the hosts of this uh, uh, evening. And I'm representing today Fundacja Danis. We are here with uh, Alex Glod uh, from StoryArc, a storyteller, TEDx speaker, online instructor, and you're going to find out more about him uh, in a bit. Before starting, um, don't forget to introduce yourself in the chat. We post a message there, you know, what you should do just before starting. Don't forget to mute, uh, to mute your microphone and get ready for an exciting hour. We hope you will enjoy it. Uh, together with Alex, um, we have selecting some topics of discussion about pitching a social uh, business. And uh, we are ready to answer as many questions as possible in the last part of the webinar. Um, and that's the plan. Uh, so I would say, let's start. So for those who are joining for the very first time, our community, uh, Fundacja Danis is a nonprofit organization. Uh, working in entrepreneurship education for more than 15 years. Since 2012, uh, we have been promoting entrepreneurship um, education uh, and social entrepreneurship in, um, at the European level in diverse partnerships with NGOs, chambers of commerce, um, consultancy companies from more than, I would say, 15 European countries. So that's a lot. Um, why do we decide to organize these um, webinar is because we truly believe that social entrepreneurship should be, let's say, spread in all our European communities. And we try to do this through most of our projects. And this webinar is part of such a project, which is um, uh, social entrepreneurship for local communities, an international project that uh, is um, uh, run together with the partners from uh, Italy, Cyprus, Belgium, and Romania. Uh, the project aims to increase motivation and improve the guidance of adults with entrepreneurial initiatives for starting social businesses and is co-funded by the European Commission uh, through the Erasmus Plus program. Uh, and as I said, it's run together with Fundacja Civitas from Romania, Central Pentru Legislative Nonprofit from Romania, uh, DSC's uh, Network from Belgium, Matera Hub from Italy, and Synthesis Center from Cyprus. Um, I will also provide very, very, very basic information about this project. You have a slide here, you know, summarizing the activities of the project. But what we do, we target uh, with this project, we target both organizations from Europe interested in supporting social entrepreneurs um, more and better, you know, to do a better job with them. Uh, but we also target social entrepreneurs. So. Um, so far, we have developed some open educational resources that can be used by organizations to help entrepreneurs incubate their social business ideas. And very soon, we're going to launch a couple of training courses, both online and in presence, for social entrepreneurs uh, who are ready to start their social businesses, or even they want maybe to organize some crowdfunding campaigns for their social business ideas. Okay. Um, I, this is just, just a short introduction just to have the context and understand why we are here tonight. I'm so happy that uh, you join us. Um, and uh, I will say very shortly, welcome uh, Carmen, Choban, Carmen, Nicola, uh, Cordelia, Emma, Larissa, Lavinia, Naomi, Natalia, Stefan, Szilard, uh, Martin. Uh, welcome, and I'm sure there will be more that will join us, at least uh, more of you uh, register for today. Uh, and we're looking for, for the discussion. And uh, as I said, coming back to the webinar, uh, we are here with uh, Alex, who for the last eight years has been working with leaders, marketers, and professionals from the corporate and the angel sector to help them to tell their stories with impact, to connect with their audiences and provide them with a memorable experience, how he says. He's an expert as uh, is an expert does in storytelling applied in uh, public speaking, marketing, entrepreneurship, and leadership. 
Now, I promised yesterday on the Facebook page that I will shortly tell you the story, how uh, we met and what's our connection with uh, Alex. And it goes back in time and it has to start in 2013. Uh, the, our connection is actually provided by the program Erasmus for Young uh, Entrepreneur. Uh, he's one of the uh, alumni of the, of the program. And uh, this program, as I said, brought us together. In 2013, a young entrepreneur from the Netherlands, Anna Heiker, uh, join uh, um, the program Erasmus for Entrepreneurs and we hosted her here in Romania where she learned to develop her business and guess what she developed it uh, so well that uh, uh, some years later she became a host entrepreneur in the Erasmus for Entrepreneurs. She has a consultancy company and she's moderating events and she's coaching professionals and entrepreneurs in pitching. So uh, Anna Heiker, when she became a host entrepreneur, she hosted Alex in the Netherlands and helped him, he will tell you more if he wants, to uh, develop his own business, Story Arc, the, story, uh, the business that she, he runs right now. Um, and just one year after the exchange uh, they had, uh, imagine that they got to organize together the very first edition of the pitching contest for young entrepreneurs within the European youth event at the European Parliament in Strasbourg. And this year they did it again. So congrats uh, for that, uh, Alex, and congrats also uh, to Anna, who is not with us today, but I'm sure she, will, she would be happy to hear that we have you here. So starting now the discussion, uh, I will challenge you, Alex, with the first question for our webinar. And this will be, you know, how did you end up organizing the pitching contest, uh, you know, at the European Parliament for young entrepreneurs? And very important, why did you do it? Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, Paula. It is a pleasure to be here. And thank you to everyone who, uh, who made the time. Uh, just think, uh, can we turn off the share screen so that uh, everyone yes, can see us? Yes. There, there we go. Okay, perfect. Yes. yes. So um, the, the story goes that uh, once we finished our... Um, our internship, one of the, the requirements was to make a nice video about our experience. And I decided that since I was already doing a lot of online courses that, you know, this one, we would make it stand out really professional, really neat looking, even though we didn't necessarily expect for it to be viewed by thousands of people. And in fact, at the end of the day, it, only, it was only viewed by even now, I think it has only like 50 or 60 views, but it was viewed by the right people. And that was the, the team at the um, at the department uh, from the European Commission that is in charge of uh, promoting the Erasmus for Young Entrepreneurs program. And they figured, well, since the pitching contest, the point of it is to promote the program, wouldn't it be better for it to be organized by actual Erasmus for Young Entrepreneurs alumni? And so uh, that's how the, uh, the story happened. It came from that. And uh, it was, uh, we, we felt humbled that we, we were asked to do this and it's been a fun experience. 2018 was, was great. 2021 was a, once again great. It was a pity we didn't have as much people as in the past present in the room, but it was still a, a worthwhile, uh, worthwhile experience. It looks be like that, at least from the Facebook uh, <laughs> post and everything uh, from the European Commission and the Erasmus for Entrepreneurs Program and so on. And for that, I wanted to ask you how it happened because it really looked like a very nice experience. And I'm sure that in that room, there were also some young people really interested to become social entrepreneurs, not only entrepreneurs, uh, because that's what we say, the new trend. And um, mm -hmm. even this webinar we organized because we believe it, it's a new trend and we really hope this will catch uh, at, in Europe, but also all over the world. Um, now, thinking to social entrepreneurs, I'm not sure if some people who joined us uh, at the very beginning, maybe they heard uh, a song. I played it intentionally because it says the sim you are simply the best. And for me, social entrepreneurs are really simple, the best, simply the best uh, entrepreneurs that you could have. Because um, most of all, I mean, most of them, if not all of them, um, are motivated to open social businesses in order to respond to a specific need in our community. They are there, okay, with the entrepreneurial initiative, but they are there because they want to help. They want to help our community. And I thank you them for that. 
Um, however, um, most of the time, they also think that the buyers of their products and services might be motivated for the same, you know, they, they might be there for the same reasons. They might have the same motivation. They might buy their products or services, you know, with the same good heart. But um, what, is, what would you recommend, you know, in approaching these buyers and consumers? Uh, should they take this direction, this motivation in including, to include it in their pitch, in their marketing strategy? What do you think? Well, ideally, it would be nice for all of us to connect around a common mission and a common value and for us to you know, come together and to, let's say that we put our expertise and they put their money and together we solve a bigger issue. It would be ideally nice, but unfortunately, or fortunately, it's not like that. I've met many young entrepreneurs who have been thinking that, you know what, since, be, since I have this great social impact, people will definitely choose me. And unfortunately, we have to understand that at the end of the day, you are a business first and a social business second. And we shouldn't have the social aspect be the forefront of what we do. We first need to think it in clear, rational business terms. Now, the reason we're doing that is because we need to understand that a sustainable business is a business that solves, first and foremost, a problem for a specific customer, and it solves it well, and it solves it better than the, the competition. And whenever we focus too much on the social aspect of the business, we might send the wrong message because people can might understand that what we're actually doing is that we're asking for a subtle donation rather than asking for, hey, look, I have a solution, please buy the solution, which is something that is counterintuitive and not productive because think about it, how many times do you actually donate a year for something? And especially in the same, to the same organization? Not really, you don't do that because at one point you're like, okay, I'm tired of donating my money. I need to buy stuff that I need. And if you think about it, the stuff that you need, you don't think twice, you buy it because you need it. And you don't think about, who you buy it from if that provider is a good provider of that service or product. So first and foremost, let us understand that people are not rational in any way. And in fact, they can even act against their own interests and values. The best example that I can give is, you know, the millennials and Gen Zs are considered to be the generation that is most preoccupied about climate change, right? We are the generation that talks about this a great deal and we're very, very much worried about it. And yet at the same time, if you look at all of the, at the people that are investing in cryptocurrencies, it's 95% millennials and Gen Z. And the, you know, the whole cryptocurrency um, environment, even though it's an interesting idea, is causing a great deal of global CO2 emissions. So we're acting very much against our own interests, right? And, and it's weird to see that happening. While in the meantime, when you actually have opportunities to invest in green energy, um, let's say electric cars, the infrastructure for electric cars, there not that many people are you know, lining up to invest their money there. Because at the end of the day, we will always first and foremost follow our, our interest. And our interest is either you give me a product that is good, that I will buy again, and that I can use regardless of whether it, your business is social or not. And second, it, if I'm investing as, as an investor, my main interest is profit. That's why, if to extend this example, if I were to, let's say, have a business that um, produces uh, renewable energy, maybe I have windmills or I have um, photovoltaic parks where I produce clean energy. If I argue to people that, hey, invest in us, we produce clean energy, that might not be actually very persuasive. What could be persuasive, and in fact would be even persuasive to the people in the fossil fuel industry, is by going to them and saying, look, it, if there's one thing for certain, is that in the next 10 years, what price of coal, gas, and oil will either fluctuate a great deal or will grow simply because we're going to have to tax a lot of the energy that is causing CO2 emissions. While in contrast, the energy that we produce will most likely not be extra taxed. The, there will be a lot of stability on this, on this front. And guess what? You will also make money out of green certificates. So where would you like to invest? And that's the game we need to play. We need to make sure that we make our social businesses first functional as traditional businesses. 
And let's treat the social part as a nice little thing that you add at the end, but not the core benefit. Because if we do, like I said, we might position ourselves as an NGO or as a place where you donate for goodwill. But if you want your business to be functional, not just on Christmas and on the times when we donate, but the whole year round, then the strategy has to be about how do I serve real people? How do I solve real problems more than anything? I would agree with you, as I said, even though uh, social entrepreneurs are the best entrepreneurs and simply the best, still, uh, I would agree with you that, yes, first, I think that would, should be the first lesson that we get from, you know, how to pitch is that, uh, first of all, think about your clients, your buyers, what they are need, their needs, just to summarize what you were saying, what are their needs, and then think that, you know, the, uh, the um, let's say the cause, the social cause could come second, like, um, maybe a more an extra motivation for the buyer to buy your service or product this is what i understand and i hope our uh, guests here for tonight uh, um, will agree with us as well and will implement in their businesses now what i also learning from what you are saying uh, so far is that you know before going to investors because this is how we imagine you know when we talk about pitching we imagine that the dragon's den or in Romania, Arena later, okay? We go there and it's a TV show and maybe it's a competition at the European Union. And that's how we imagine our pitch. And that will be, you know, in our mind when we talk about pitch. But actually what I see now is that when we um, try to open, you know, to open a social business, actually the first people that comes uh, that come into our mind are the consumers, the buyers. And these are the ones that we need to pitch and we need to pitch them uh, probably every day with our business ideas. So. Could we start with this? Like, how should they, um, how should you know the social entrepreneurs prepare themselves for this? Let's call it everyday pitching or daily pitching to different buyers or consumers or close stakeholders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Definitely, I hear it's um, it's quite, again a, quite a counterintuitive thing that happens whenever, for example, let's say we meet up with someone and they ask us what do we do. We always tend to go by answering, well, uh, I'm a social entrepreneur, I have this business, and this is what we do. But in fact, that question has a different meaning, or at least we can rephrase it in our minds and answer it in a more interesting and sp specific way. And that is, what can you do for me? So rather than ask, answering, what do you do in general? Answer, what can you do for the person asking the question? Because this way, you then have the possibility of getting an answer, uh, uh, a follow-up of, ah, interesting, okay. And if by any chance that person really needs what you're about to give them, in quite instantly you can engage in what is a initial transaction, or at least people quickly associate what you have to offer. So let's say you have a bakery, right? That where you maybe you employ people. Uh, from disadvantaged backgrounds or people with disabilities. And that is a great thing that you are doing, right? And you are meeting up with, by chance, maybe at a friend's gathering, doesn't have to be a, an official gathering. You meet up with a principal of a school. And that principal asks, hey, so uh, what do you do? So rather than simply saying, hey, I run this bakery, you could think to yourself, well, for example, um, you know how for every beginning of the school year, it really matters the ceremony to go very well. And you wanna make sure that that day is memorable. Well, what do we do is that we take care that if you, whenever you organize any ceremony for your school, especially the New Year's, we are all prepared with the best uh, cookies, the best, uh, um, the best pastries that will make anyone participating in that ceremony feel uh, in really, really surprised. And at the same time, there will be all the more amazed once they find out the story that with this, uh, with this simple investment, you've actually supported people that have not had the same education that the people in your school have, uh, have had. Now that is prompt people to be like, huh, interesting. Well, yeah, yeah, th that would be an interesting idea. I never thought I could do that. I never thought I could uh, work with a bakery for, for this occasion. And wow, this would be an even better uh, alternative. And like, I can also support a nice little business. Yeah, let's, let's talk, let's keep in touch, right? This is a little exercise that I recommend all of you to do. So if there's one thing you, you can do after we, after we end today's webinar is, I want you to think of 
10 different potential customer groups that you could address or people that you could interact with that could benefit from your product. And then let's say you, uh, if we go with the, the example of the bakery, sure, we have a school principal, then I could think of maybe a CEO of a company, maybe I think of an event organizer, maybe I meet actually a wedding organizer to be even more specific. Maybe I meet a priest, maybe I meet, you know, you think of a, a different types of 10 people. And then I would write my script or at least like prepare that pitch answering like what I could do for you based on those different profiles. Now, what this does is that it takes you out of that paradigm that you are that, like describing yourself simply as we are a social business, blah, blah, blah. And then focusing on how you can always you know, serve different groups of people. And what will happen is that most often you realize that you actually have people like that in your circle, but you've never ever thought to yourself, hey, I could actually approach them and tell them I could do that for them, right? So this is, the idea of pitching is also something that can really inspire uh, you to discover new strategies for business growth. Because it's not just a nice little communication tactic. It's a way in which you can find out some great new ideas to grow your business. I remember we, we suggested this simple exercise, like, hey, uh, think about all of the people you can serve and uh, you know, create a different uh, answer to the question, what do you do for, uh, for each of them? And many have come up with the idea of like, huh, now that I think about it, I, have, I haven't even thought about approaching these people. And many have had this example of finding customers uh, just based on that. So that's a, one of the things that I would recommend. Start off by looking at the pitch as the answer to what can you do for me? Find 10 different groups of people, answer that question for each group of, of those people, and then either have it prepared whenever the right person comes, or even better, if you already have people in that fit those descriptions in your network, or you know people who can give you access to those people, well then start already. Like don't wait for the big investors event, you can start with uh, simply with that. So that's a very different approach. And I think the exercise uh, will be very useful. And as I say, it's a very different approach because usually, you know, when you go into a training room uh, with uh, entrepreneurs, me, myself, and maybe other trainers, we're going to teach them about, you know, um, for sure, different structures of pitch and for sure, Simon Sinek and why, how, and what, because, you know, this is the golden circle. And you know, they, they train themselves and they um, learn how to express their values, what they want to bring, why they want to do that good in the community, how they want to do the things, what they want to do. But uh, most of the time we learn, you know, in the end, uh, a short pitch, a short speech that we tell it over and over again without considering who's there in front of us. And maybe the same why, how, and what, at least this is how I translate to your recommendation, is that you can uh, put that why, how, and what, thinking, okay, uh, who's there in front of me? And the how, the how and the what will actually help that uh, specific group or that specific uh, person. So that's very, very wise advice and, uh, and thank you. <laughs> and 10, 10 people or 10 group of people, that's a lot. And I think the number is important as well, because as you said, this will actually um, challenge us to find even um, groups of clients or buyers that we didn't think about and or even crazy ideas that we could explore even more with our business. So, yeah, so for those who didn't uh, uh, get it from the very begin beginning, because I'm still admitting people. <laughs> uh, Yes, that's a good exercise, you know, think to 10 group of people that uh, uh, could uh, gain could be your clients for your social business and try to see uh, to build your pitch to each group thinking uh, about you know what in it for uh, for them for uh, this specific uh, group so that's the first exercise that you have to do mm -hmm. um i'm feel like a little bit favor here because i'm the one uh, uh asking all the questions but uh, just a reminder i put already in the chat you know i keep uh, putting the, the text you know if you have questions for alex please write it down write them down there and uh, we're going to try to answer in the second part of the, the webinar. Uh, please do ask questions. I don't want to be the only one that uh, is asking <laughs> questions or commenting on your exercises. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to take those questions at the end. Now, 
because in the end, okay, we go and uh, we pitch um, to these potential clients and we have uh, to, we train ourselves for this uh, daily pitch. In the end, I might get there. I mean, I hope and I hope for all entrepreneurs to get in, in front of potential investors, uh, even if it's not the, the Dragon's Den, Arena Laylor, or, you know, I don't know what big contest. Uh, maybe we can get in some business angel meetings or in through our network, we can reach some uh, good investors. How they should prepare uh, differently for this, what we could call to be, I don't know, stage pitch, if we want to call mm -hmm. it like that, how they should prepare differently for, for this um, phase uh, of their business? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, basically, once we uh, move to this new style of pitching where we're not just pitching the idea in order to find a potential customer but we're looking for investors uh, what we need to do is now realize that we need to now think of what is the actually the investor looking for whenever they are looking to invest in a business and most of the times one of the fallacies that we could fall into is the idea that we need to pr pr present the perfect pitch right we need to really have everything nuts all the nuts and bolts right then and there and in fact, what I've discovered after talking with many investors, especially in, um, in the pitching contest we had in, in Strasbourg, is that whenever they see a perfect pitch, that's when they start feeling a little bit skeptical, like, hmm, something, something has to be off. And whenever we, as a social business, we're coming up there, we want to be perfect. Like, you know, look at us, the perfect uh, idea. So the first thing to take into account, don't plan for perfect. Instead plan for what exactly a, a uh, investor is looking for in the long run. So here, the first advice applies once again, you're a business first and a social business second, right? So you still need to come up with a very functional business model. And, uh, and that's something that they will appreciate. And uh, then of course, there is, of course, uh, you need to think about what you bring to the table, why your business is innovative. But it's also good to be transparent and open about the challenges that you may face, right? Like this is something that most companies, not just social businesses, but most companies are afraid to admit in the pitching phase. They start off by simply saying, look, there are 3 million potential customers. We're going to reach them and it's going to be great. Like our business idea is amazing. And most often that's not going to be the case. And most entrepreneurs and most investors they're seasoned. They know. They look at that and saying, oh, my God, you're so naive. You're not aware that that's not really how it works. So what you can say instead is simply go by the rule of what we want, of course, is in three years to reach these many people and to have this much impact. But we're very much aware that we cannot do this alone. We are a very young team. We're very motivated, but we don't have the same business acumen. And that's why we're looking for an investor who is willing to mentor us and help us develop better skills and know how to position ourselves in the market. And we're looking to receive an investment of, let's say 50,000 uh, euros that will help us buy better equipment and also invest in advertising so that we are well known in the market and we have more access to people. Now, if you are aware of the fact that there are challenges, that there are things that you need help with, because otherwise, why would you ask for investment? If there's no challenges and everything is gonna be fine, why should people invest in you? Go out there and do put that plan in, in implementation. If you come with this more honest and down to uh, to earth approach, you will be surprised of the the openness you will find from from uh, investors. We tend to think that investors are very uh, cruel and cold, capital you know capitalists. They are like, oh, I just want money and profit. But in fact, they, they tend to be very restrained because most of the times people come with these very unrealistic presentations and seeing that every single time bores them out. And whenever they actually see someone authentic, but someone who has a vision, has a dream and is willing to be transparent and open to learn, that's something that is rare. And if you catch that, that is a, is a great opening. And um, that, that's, the first, uh, that, that's the first approach that I recommend, you know. Again, have a strong business model, but don't be afraid to admit your shortcomings when talking to investors. That actually can be an advantage.
Mm -hmm. So in other words, you know, get very well prepared for that meeting. I mean, you have to know very well your business model and your numbers, figures that you put out there and to be confident. I mean, I imagine that the confidence is still needed in, in that yeah. uh, pitch. Uh, but at the same time, don't believe that you are perfect. Um, and from the very beginning, when you build that uh, presentation, think about the challenges or the problems that might appear on the road and how you want you know, people actually to support you. So we learned, first of all, that if we didn't learn so far that we are not perfect, we cannot be perfect social entrepreneurs. And I think even the investors are not the perfect entrepreneurs. I'm sure they made mistakes during their, you know, so, you know, as uh, when they started um, uh, their business, I'm sure they also made mistakes and uh, we can count on them to actually help us to avoid some of these mistakes. But let's think that we are not perfect and our business model definitely cannot be perfect or completely, you know, um, working because we still need the, the help from, from the others. And we need to see uh, those points and put them out there, not as weaknesses, but things to improve. This is what I understand. So, yeah, be authentic, be um, honest with what you have there, the goods and the bads, and get ready to, you know, to improve. Okay, um, that's very, you know, I would say very helpful so far, at least for me, I'm learning new things and uh, I thank you for that. I hope the others are also learning new things. So we are still having people joining. We are in mm -hmm. the middle of the <laughs> meeting already, but people are still joining and I'm happy for that. Um, and we are all here and actually we invited you here, as you know already, because you are an expert okay, in pitching and you uh, worked for, you have been working already for so many years in supporting others to uh, pitch better and better um, their uh, ideas and we are so you being an expert we also have this um, expectation that you could give us a recipe you know a shortcut mm -hmm. I don't want to go necessarily uh, you know go there and read many many books on pitching uh, and uh, learn from all the videos maybe I want to do that too but first it will be lovely to have um, tonight um, I don't know a shortcut a recipe of how should we structure um, our um, pitch or you know what what should we know about the structure of a daily pitch or a stage pitch or you know if there's something um, some common rules that we should uh, learn about okay sure um just a second i think just make sure that i can share the screen because i can share like one simple recipe that we i mean i usually recommend because it's a universal thing and sometimes most people think like yeah but isn't there a new innovation a new way of doing things and it's like, well, yes, but at the same time, sometimes we're, if we're trying to reinvent the wheel, we might actually miss out on what is actually working. And from my experience, the same recipe has been, you know, universal up until this mm -hmm. point. I have checked here, multiple participants oh, can share perfect. simultaneously, so I it should work. <laughs> okay, it there works. we go. It does work. Thank you. Okay, That's perfect. wonderful. So the, the pitch structure, um, now this, you can always... Um, how should I say, customized to your own situation, right? Maybe um, you change a little bit the order or you focus on one more than the other. Uh, but generally, I would recommend having at least these checklists in your presentation. So first, make sure to have a strong opening, right? Start off with a question or a statement, a very bold statement. This way, rather than Starting off with, hello, everyone. Thank you very much for your attention. My name is, today I'm here to present. You simply start strong with, how often do we waste plastic simply because we didn't realize the solution was right under our noses? That question gets people be like, oh, what is that solution that is hiding under our noses, right? Or you could say, we are creating a lot of plastic and it is our fault. And that's a bold statement. You're like, okay, so it's my, oh, oh, all right. That's maybe you've antagonized me a little bit, but I'm listening. All right, let me, let's see what you, what you bring to the table. Then we speak about the customer. Now, um, and then the third point is the problem. And sometimes you can actually switch between the two, but I usually recommend starting with the customer. And I would go something like, there are many young people out there who are really concerned about the environment. They want to have a smaller footprint. Yet every day, they have to do the following. This is where I bring in the problem. If they want to have clean drinking water, most likely the tap they have at home 
does not give them clean drinking water. So what do they have to do? They have to go every day to the supermarket, buy those big bottles of plastic and grab them all, walk them up the stairs, bring them home. And once they use all that water, then they have to either go into recycling or even if they have the energy, most likely it goes into the trash. Now that's something that we need to stop. And the solution is right before our eyes. And that solution is our ready-made water filter that can be installed in any home, in any tap, and it only requires one small hole. And after that, you are set and good to go. What are the main benefits of this? First and foremost, we give people time. Rather than always having to worry about, oh my God, whenever I go shopping, I need to buy a lot of uh, bottles of water, we make sure that we take that pressure off their minds. They can focus on what is important and they don't have to worry about that. Second, it will ease their feeling about their, um, their plastic footprint. I mean, let's be honest, most of the time recycling doesn't really work. And in most of the, in, especially in Romania and in other Eastern European countries, the infrastructure isn't really that reliable. So the best solution isn't to recycle, but rather to cut uh, consumption altogether. And more than anything, let's be honest, the people that actually have to buy their water from the store, do you think that they use that water to cook their food? No, most likely they're gonna use the tap water, which they already know isn't that healthy and good to drink. So then imagine that we also bring them water that it really is a lot healthier that they can cook in, therefore their meals, are gonna be a lot healthier and we make sure that in time they're not gonna have any kidney problems. Our business model is simple. With this simple investment, we make sure that we give any of our customers anywhere between six, to, six months to one year of clean drinking water without changing the filters. And if they need to change the filter, the cost will be only $25. So our services will make sure that we give any family and anyone, we, we give them this. It's a very easy uh, service to install. They can, of course, work with the, with the plumber, but they can easily install it on their own, IKEA style. And whenever they need a uh, replacement, they can easily subscribe and we will give it to them planned out either six months, nine months, or one year later. Now we are a, a, a very dynamic team. I myself, I am the founder, but I also have our marketing team and our engineers who are all very excited to put this uh, business out there and for us to really start making this dramatic change. Now, while we are all passionate, none of us have ever started a business before. So what we're looking for is an investor that can help us better uh, promote our product, to find partners and, and customer niches that we've never discovered up until this point and um, to give us the boost that we need in order to uh, properly produce at scale. Because once we, we manage to put this idea out there and we're gonna have a lot of offers, it would be a pity to only deliver them five uh, days or weeks or months after people have already said, yes, I want to buy this. Our vision is to reach not only people here in Romania in the next few years, we would like to then expand to countries uh, close to us. We know we have a great deal of competition. We know it's gonna be challenging to change uh, people's behavior, but with the right investment and the right mentoring, we know we can make that happen. Our uh, pledge to you is to invest in our idea. We're looking for a $100,000 initial investment. We are willing to give 15% equity to our company. And we believe that in the next five to, to 10 years, we can not only re reach 100% return on investment, but I believe we can also be proud of bringing our contribution to a world with less plastic and in a world where we can actually drink a lot of clean drinking water from the tap. So this was a, a simple example with a gener generic product that maybe you have at home and if not, I hope my pitch persuaded you to do so. So this is, a, this is the structure that I would recommend. And like I said, you can play around with some of these, uh, these ones. You can go into more details with some, while others you can skim through, depending on your subject, depending on the situation. But this is the place to go. Um, and what I recommend is take this recipe, write one version, 
and then move on to writing the second one, and then move on to writing the third one. Most of the times we feel very pressured in making sure that our first draft is the perfect one. And if it's one advice that I can give you from Stephen King and all the great writers out there is that most writing is actually rewriting. We think that the great writers that we read are just, they sit, they have the idea, they write the perfect story and they're like, good, send it to the publisher. When in fact, the real process of writing is the rewriting, the re assembling, the re, re, reassessing of the whole idea. And that's what I invite you to do with your pitch. Write one version, write the second, write the third, and only afterwards you can really feel like, okay, I'm getting the hang of this. I think I can, I think I know what is the right, uh, the right version. And also give it out to people and receive their feedback and see where you can make the nice little tweaks. Once you find a good formula, it's all a matter of practice, of Re, uh, retelling that pitch over and over. Because if there's one thing that is true is that people need repetition in order to memorize something. We will, it would be nice for telling the pitch once and for you to win. You need to tell that story. You need to keep on telling it. And uh, sooner rather than later, the right people will hear it and that message will resonate to them in the right, uh, in the right place. So yeah, this is... Uh, I hope this uh, kind of uh, fulfills the expectation in terms of the shortcut and the recipe. <laughs> it is. It's a very clear structure. As you said, uh, uh, it's not something that we should invent the wheel. You know, you have all the information that you uh, need there as an investor, but also as a person, you know, as a buyer. Um, I was just uh, thinking that it sounded so, you know, um, perfectly when you express it, you know, for the business idea. And it's so, uh, and we have actually a question. I want to connect to that question that we have in the chat is mm -hmm. that it might be easier or it feels sometimes, especially when we're in the service uh, uh, sector, that it's easier. It's always easier when we have a product. It's always mm -hmm. easier to pitch for a product. And it's much uh, harder to pitch for a service, for an experience. And one of the questions that we have in the chat um, is that, uh, okay, if there are any tips for more abstract fields, uh, business fields like communication, cooperation, I'm not sure what is HSE education. It might be health uh, and safety. I'm not really sure. Mm -hmm. um, Marta, maybe you can uh, tell us um, um, what is HSE. But, you know, basically, if there are any tips for more abstract fields, I will say more service fields. Mm -hmm. Sure, definitely. Well, one thing that you probably noticed in the pitch is that I didn't talk about the product per se at all. Like, if I were a traditional, let's say, laptop salesman, I would have told you something like, oh, look, it has this much eight, this much RAM, this much storage, uh, this is the processor. And in the same way, I didn't tell you about what filters does it have, uh, you know, how it is, it is produced or things, you know, German quality. I didn't use those uh, symptoms because what I focused on is what is the customer experience, how it can change it, what are the main benefits? And in a similar way, a service follows the same pattern. At the end of the day, it's not about what you do specifically, but how you change people's lives. So my invitation is to think about how is uh, people's lives without your service? So let's say you are an HR consultant and you do recruiting for small companies that don't need an HR department, right? So how is life before you appear in the picture? Well, they run ra random ads on e-jobs. They're hoping people discover their, um, their job posts. And whoever comes, either they're not really that prepared. And, or some people come, they seem like good candidates, but they don't really know how to evaluate them. And so what happens is that either they screen for a lot of interviews or they invest a lot of money in, in promoting their jobs. And at the end of the day, they might not even find the right candidate and two or three months later, they have to kick them away. What do you do that saves their lives? Like what makes their lives better? Well, first and foremost, if you are a professional HR, one thing that you know better to do is to uh, niche and restrict uh, your promotion, right? So you can save them a lot of money in terms of promoting their job openings. You can save them the time because you will take care of the CV screening, and the interviews, right? Most importantly, you will make sure you'll guarantee that those, uh, those candidates are actually more suitable for the job because you've done the due diligence. You have actually made sure 
that that person not only fits your job description, but also that your company fits that person. So they are more interested in staying there, right? And that's, that's how you should frame your service f- through the lens of how you make your customers' lives better. It takes a bit of work to work through it, but the best way to find that is, again, thinking of the pitch, building it around very specific customer bases. So if I were to think of, if I'm an HR recruiter, rather than making a pitch for general recruitment, I would say specifically uh, for IT recruitment, where there are a lot of very specific challenges there, like f- finding the right candidates for uh, you know, Java developers and stuff like that. It's super, super hard. The competition is way out there. So there you can speak about how you tackle those specific challenges and how you help your potential customers. Or maybe you, you're, you can, you're very adept in recruiting people for very technical fields, like in engineering, uh, for maybe you can even recruit people for the European Space Station. You know what I mean? Like be very specific about what you can do and how you can help people. And that, that's how you manage to uh, position, position it, right? You don't need to speak about your credentials. You don't need to say that you are certificated and whatnot. Maybe it is important for some people, but I wouldn't focus on that too much. Focus on how you change their lives. How is their life before you appear? And how is their life once you appear in, uh, in, the, in the background, like in their story? <laughs> mm-hmm. That looks like a lot of work. I mean, before, you know, you cannot start, what I understand, you know, especially when you um, design services is that you cannot just, you know, go there and say, this is my service. I mean, yes, you have some uh, images in mind of what you want to deliver, what is the experience that you want to provide, what are the values, what are, you know, the uh, core activities, what you can do, what is your expertise. But what I understand here is that you really need to explore what are the client's needs, especially when we talk about the services, maybe even more than in case of the products, because you Mm -hmm. need to learn how is the life, their life before you come there with your uh, services. What we call in design thinking, because that's something that we use a lot in our training courses, like you need to empathize with your clients and maybe in service design even more than uh, in product design. So thank you and I hope this uh, help. I see that uh, Martin said thank you and uh, thank you. We I have also a private uh, a question in the private chat. So I guess I'm not allowed to give a lot of details, but what I understand is that it's a consultancy company that tries to um, that design service for another company. And in the service that uh, they want to include, they need a partner, an international company, and they need to pitch to that company to become their partner. So if there's any specific advice that we can give, you know, in terms of um, uh, how should we, you know, think of this uh, a little bit different. So it's not an investor, it's not necessarily a buyer, but it's someone that I want to bring them you know, in business with me to go and provide this business to another company, if there's some perspective that we could take. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. In One ways. of the things that we were uh, encouraged to do when we, like when I started with StoryArc, I had my, my business partner back then, we, the thing that we were encouraged when we joined our first accelerator was to do a lot of interviews with our potential customers. And in those interviews to ask the dumbest questions possible, like, every little detail until we find the right thing. And what we did back then, we, we interviewed a lot of HR because the people in HR are the ones that buy tra- training services like for storytelling and things of that nature. And only then did we get to understand the needy greedy, the specifics, the thing that they hate about working with service providers like us, the things that they like about working with service providers like us, what they would want from service providers like us and things of that nature, like what could help them trust us more, what could break the trust that they could have in us. So we've asked a lot of these questions. And what I would recommend is in a similar vein, to have a discussion with someone that fits that profile, one or two uh, people where you ask in more detail. Now, most likely you are not the first person who, or the first company that uh, needs this type of partnership. And I'm pretty sure there are many companies either in your close network or in your, let's say, second wave of, uh, of networks that you could ask and say, look, um, we are a small company. We are planning to do this. 
Um, and we would love some advice to know what is it that we can do in order to uh, partner up with the company of your profile. Uh, could you give us like 30 minutes so that we can you can tell us like what should what should a company like us look for in order to you know uh, make it in the in this in this regard? And you will be surprised that how many people are actually open to answer your questions because at the end of the day it benefits them as well. So it's like ah so. This is so this time these people actually come to me and they want my point of view. Most of the times people are suffer from the fact that they they don't feel they're properly listened to. And so whenever some someone says, hey, I'm interested in your point of view, most likely they're like, uh, yeah, oh, be sure. Well, wow, that's of course, if I can help in any way, definitely. And um then in that meeting, just simply be open about all of the, the things you don't know and ask as many follow-up questions and get to very, very specific things. And once you do that, um, most often what, once you finish that interview, um, the person will feel inclined to say, well, yeah, yeah, and uh, tell me about you. Like, wh what are you guys doing? Like, what are you preparing? And most often they will be open to hear your story, what you're working on. And if they find that, huh, well, you know, I like your approach. I like that you're already interviewing before you actually make an offer, which is great. Uh, look, work on your offer and get back to me in a week or two. Maybe we could work, actually work together on this thing. You know, and uh, that's a nice little trick that you can pull. Like for me, most in, in the, those 10 interviews that we've had with HR people uh, around, you know, trying to understand their realities and everything, seven of them became our clients afterwards. So it can be a nice way through the door when you are not known in the market, you you don't have the credentials or the, the experience. You can go down this route. You simply kindly ask for guidance and, uh, and for them to give you their input. And um, most likely you will find openness. And, uh, and then there, from there, you get the insights necessary to know how to approach uh, a company that, uh, that would fit the profile you're looking for. Mm -hmm. So, and if I understand correctly, first go and make them pitch to you their business <laughs> in a way, you know, when they start to talk about their businesses and how they do the things. And when you are interviewing, you show them that you are curious about their business. So basically they're, you know, looking at you and said, okay, let me pitch my business to you and uh, what we are doing and what are our values and what are our activities. And then you get back to pitch your own business. Um, I'm joking, but yeah, this is how I translate it a little bit in, in an exaggerated way. Sure, <laughs> make sure, them, make like, them what, talk what about would, their business, yes. True, but what I would focus on here specifically is exactly the experience that they usually have. So to give you an example, and then maybe this way it's more specific. So when we, well, when we were interviewing the HRs, we were asking like, what do you hate about trainers in general? Like, or working with training companies. Um, what do you like about that? Um, what are the things that can break the relationship between you and a training provider? Things of that nature. Uh, can you give us, uh, like, what have been the things that you didn't like in, the, in your previous collaborations? Like, these questions are crucial because that's where the true insight lies. Once you figured out, huh, there we go. That's what's, uh, what's going on. Like, ah, people are missing out on that. Like, let's be honest, trainers have a bit of a bad rep. And if, especially if you're coming as a new trainer, it's good to know from the people in HR, like, hey, don't do this. Instead, come with this approach. And so in a similar way, you need to find out that information as well. Like, how can you not be cringy? How can you not be, um, you know, ag aggressive in your approach? And how can you actually be inviting and interesting for your potential customer or partner, right? Um, and the same goes for investors. Like before you even go on an, on a stage of an investor, see if you know someone who is an investor, ask someone to introduce you to an investor and just ask them everything uh, about what it, what is there, has been their experience. And this way you'll know what ex real expectations to have. Because we, we've also asked them like, what, what convinces you to buy from a trainer? Like do the certifications matter? Do these matter? And most often, what we thought would be important for the sales was like, no, uh, we wanna make sure the people are real and authentic. Like, yes, sometimes we do have to buy from certain providers because they're very well known and they have a big, uh, you know, big name, 
but actually what we are more looking for is people that we can relate to that, you know, that are more uh, creative and honest and fit our culture. So this way you find out the insights because sometimes we might feel that we have to present ourselves in a certain way, but the best answer to how should I present myself is you'll find that at your customer. Like I'm here to give you some guidance and general rules, but the, the final answer is, is with them. Mm -hmm. All clear for me. I hope it also help, uh, it helps the person that asked me privately. If not, uh, maybe I can connect the two of you. Uh, maybe you could be the first partner <laughs> before, uh, before uh, going to the other uh, business. Um, we started at six sharp. I want to finish at seven sharp as promised, uh, because I know it's evening and everyone probably has other plans, uh, for, uh, today. And, um, my last question, because, you know, um, what, at least what we discovered so far, uh, okay, we learned some exercise, we learned how to approach the investors. Uh, we understood, you know, what the structure that we can follow what is the structure that we can follow and definitely it's a lot of work. And I'm sure that here are people that, uh, are committed to more work for their social business idea and um, they're here also to learn more okay we got the shortcut we learned some uh, basic stuff but could you recommend us maybe some resources to further work on our uh, pitch or where to can where we can read more or maybe how we can learn more from you because i know that also story arcs uh, provides a lot of training courses um, so if you can recommend some resources that we can access um, after this webinar Sure, it would be it would definitely be my pleasure. So um, one to, to, to start off with where I can help and how I could be a, a, of assistance. Uh, one of the courses that um, I've created early on was the Storytelling for Marketing and Entrepreneurship course. We then renamed it to the Entrepreneur's Guide to Storytelling and Marketing. And it has been one of our, our, our one of our most successful courses uh, on Udemy since then. And it is, um, th this course really helps because it helps you build not just the, the nice little story, but also the, the infrastructure to back that story up. So in this course, what we do is that we help you build the story of your business, then the story of your product. So how do you manage to communicate that in a, in a more human way, but in an effective way, in, in a way that is centered around the customer. Then we help you transform the customer experience into a hero's journey where you don't just think about how you persuade the person and to sell and then you leave them and whatever. In fact, you focus very much on how the experience after buying your products or services turns them in time into a brand ambassador, someone who becomes your new voice, the person who will spread out your message. Because let's be honest, uh, advertising, direct online advertising has lo lower and lower conversion rate but the, the communication channel that has the most powerful conversion rate is word of mouth, right? The, whatever, what recommendation comes from a friend, the, the current statistics are somewhere around 50%. So if you have 100 people that are recommending you, at least 50 uh, new customers will come their way if they each talk to one uh, friend about your potential business, about what you do, about their experience with you. Then we talk about the power of word of mouth and networking and how to build a tribe around what you do. And last but not least, content marketing and how you can create little bits of content and experiences that can make people more aware of what you do and can extend, expand the word. So I'll leave a link in the chat to a special offer that we have where you can either buy this course individually or you can buy it together with some of some other of our storytelling courses if it's something you feel you want to, uh, to discover on, uh, on your own. And uh, of course, I also invite you to, to follow me on LinkedIn. If you have any other specific questions after this webinar that you'd feel more comfortable addressing uh, directly, feel free to do so. And other than that, um, my honest advice is simply rather than, like I said, going out there and finding books or things of that nature, my, my invitation is book meetings to people, to the, for the people that you want to present to. Simply do that. Get a lot of information. They are the best resource. Your customers, your potential investors, they are the ones that can give you the best information. And um, if you commit to at least three or five interviews in the next few weeks, trust me, you're going to get a lot in return. Mm -hmm. 
That's wonderful. And uh, yeah, um, that's definitely a resource. I, I myself, I started that uh, one of the, the, the one of the first uh, uh, courses on storytelling for entrepreneurs that you had on Udemy. So, and I can guarantee it was a very good experience. Um, yes, unfortunately, yes, it's seven sharp and I wanted to say <laughs> something more, but I will stop here. Uh, I had more questions, uh, maybe more than our participants, but I will stop here and I will just uh, uh, say a big, 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 big thank you, Alex, for joining us and uh, for, you know, uh, giving us some small advices on how to pitch uh, our social business ideas. And I hope it was useful for everyone, for sure. Uh, I, from where I stand, uh, it was uh, useful, and I hope that at least participants caught some of your energy. You know, some of your <laughs> some of your entrepreneurial energy, and uh, this could motivate them in um, further develop their business idea or their social business they already have. Uh, before saying goodbye to everyone, uh, I will just uh, remind um, uh, remind everyone that uh, at the beginning I mentioned the project in which we organized this webinar which is called Social Entrepreneurship in Local Communities uh, that gave us the context to organize the webinar. And I mention it again because at the latest next week, we're going to launch um, the call for applicants for the training courses that we have for social entrepreneurs uh, at the beginning of uh, their uh, social business. And it they won't be focused on storytelling. So definitely you should also check what Alex recommended. Our training courses will be more, you know, helping social entrepreneurs to develop their business ideas and also to go in crowdfunding. So different kind of pitch and a different in really <laughs> building crowdfunding campaigns. But we're gonna give, uh, give you detail later on our, you know, social media uh, pages, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, together with our partners from Romania, the ones that I mentioned, and from Italy and Belgium and Cyprus, we will all share information. So it's impossible to miss that information. So thank you, thank you, thank you, um, all of you for joining us and for being with us tonight. Uh, it was a pleasure to have you here. And uh, yeah, stay safe, all of you, and uh, take care. Yeah, stay safe. And uh, we wish you a great deal of success with your business, regardless of what stage it is. And uh, may we hear your story and may we be also uh, impacted and inspired by, by your success. Yes. Thank you for the comments. I'm impressed. You have to read in the chat, uh, Alex. <laughs> and I'm so uh, happy. And I hope people are not just nice with us, <laughs> but it's really <laughs> what they uh, live tonight. And I'm happy that uh, it was like that. Thank you, everyone. And enjoy your evening. And take care. Have a good well. evening. Bye-bye.